You can roughly locate any community in the world somewhere along a scale running all the way from democracy to despotism. One community may be near the democracy end, another somewhere in the middle, and a third may be near the despotism end. Let's find out about despotism. This man makes it his job to study these things. Well, for one thing, avoid the comfortable idea that the mere form of government can of itself safeguard a nation against despotism. Germany, under President Hindenburg, was a republic. And yet in this republic, an aggressive despotism took root and flourished under Adolf Hitler. When a competent observer looks for signs of despotism in a community, he looks beyond fine words and noble phrases. One nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Many observers have found that two workable yardsticks help in discovering how near a community is to despotism. The respect scale and the power scale. A careful observer can use a respect scale to find how many citizens get an even break. As a community moves towards despotism, respect is restricted to fewer people. A community is low on a respect scale if common courtesy is withheld from large groups of people on account of their political attitudes. If people are rude to others because they think their wealth and position gives them that right, or because they don't like a man's race or his religion. Equal opportunity for all citizens to develop useful skills is one basis for rating a community on a respect scale. The opportunity to develop useful skills is important, but not enough. The equally important opportunity to put skills to use is a further test on a respect scale. A power scale is another important yardstick of despotism. It gauges the citizens' share in making the community's decisions. Communities which concentrate decision-making in a few hands rate low on a power scale and are moving towards despotism. Like France under the Bourbon kings, one of whom said, the state, I am the state. Today, democracy can ebb away in communities whose citizens allow power to become concentrated in the hands of bosses. What I say goes, see? I'm the law around here. <laughs> the test of despotic power is that it can disregard the will of the people. It rules without the consent of the governed. Look beyond the legal formalities of an election in measuring a community on the power scale to see if the ballot is really free. If the citizens can vote only the way they're told, a community approaches despotism. When legislatures become ceremonial assemblies only and have no real control over lawmaking, their community rates low on a power scale. In a downright despotism, opposition is dangerous whether the despotism is official or whether it is unofficial. The spread of respect and power in a community is influenced by certain conditions, which many observers measure by means of the economic distribution and information scales. If a community's economic distribution becomes slanted, its middle income groups grow smaller and despotism stands a better chance to gain a foothold. Where land is privately owned, one sign of a poorly balanced economy 
is the concentration of land ownership in the hands of a very small number of people. When farmers lose their farms, they lose their independence. This one can stay on, but not as his own boss anymore. To the extent that this condition exists throughout a nation, the likelihood of despotism is increased. In communities which depend almost entirely on a single industry, such as a factory or mine, maintaining economic balance is a challenging problem. If this condition exists over the nation as a whole, so that the control of jobs and business opportunities is in a few hands, despotism stands a good chance. Another sign of a poorly balanced economy is a taxation system that presses heaviest on those least able to pay. A larger part of a small income is spent on necessities such as food. Sales taxes on such necessities hit the small income harder. In the days of the salt tax, feudal despotisms were partly sustained by this and other forms of sales tax. A community rates low on an information scale when the press, radio, and other channels of communication are controlled by only a few people, and when citizens have to accept what they are told. In communities of this kind, despotism stands a good chance. See how such a community trains its teachers. Bear this in mind. Young people cannot be trusted to form their own opinions. This business about open-mindedness is nonsense. It's a waste of time trying to teach students who think for themselves. It's our job to tell them. And when teachers put such training into practice, despotism stands a good chance. These children are being taught to accept uncritically whatever they're told. Questions are not encouraged. How can you ask such a question? Have you got a textbook? Yes, ma'am. Does it say here that our law courts are always just? Yes, ma'am. Then how dare you question the fact? Sit down. And so we aren't surprised when... But it must be true. I saw it in this book right here. And if books and newspapers and the radio are efficiently controlled, the people will read and accept exactly what the few in control want them to. Government censorship is one form of control. A newspaper which breaks a government censorship rule can be suspended. It is also possible for newspapers and other forms of communication to be controlled by private interests. I thought I told you to kill that story. It'll cost us a lot of advertising. If that story goes out, I quit. All right. What sort of community do you live in? Where would you place it on a democracy despotism scale? To find out, you can rate it on a respect scale and a power scale. And to find out what way it is likely to go in the future, you can rate it on economic distribution and information scales. The lower your community rates on economic distribution and information scales, the lower it is likely to rate on respect and power scales, and thus to approach despotism. What happens in a single community is the problem of its own citizens. But it is also the problem of us all. Because as communities go, so goes the nation.
Hi everybody, I'm Skip Elsheimer. Welcome to the AV Geeks Lunchtime Streaming Show, where we watch old 16mm films. That one was from 1945, um, right after we got out of World War II. There's a couple of films that talk about, um, they're cautionary tales about, like, well, we were just in a war uh, fighting despotic fascist regimes. Uh, we should be careful because it could happen here. Um, and that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, thanks for uh, tuning in today. Uh, we were, Katrina and I were actually in Washington, D.C. last week, going to some museums. And uh, yeah, it was kind of great. So I have some footage at the end, um, uh, some home movies of Washington, D.C. Um, in the meantime, let's uh, learn about the characteristics of given behavior. Enjoy. stage in the evolution of man's upright posture may be represented by the posture and locomotor characteristics of the gibbon, Hylobates lar. The horizontal vertebral column of a typical mammal has changed to a position in which the vertebral column stands on its end, according to assumptions sponsored by Gregory and others. The pronograde type of locomotion exemplified by the lemur has changed into the orthograde posture typified by the gibbon, the intermediate posture of the chimpanzee and the upright posture of man. When the gibbon is brachiating or swinging, the line of support is from the hands to arms to shoulders and to back. When man walks, the line of support is from the feet to legs to hips and to back. It is assumed that the adaptations of locomotion in trees by swinging or brachiating behavior was associated with reorientation of the primate trunk so that man walks on the ground. This freed his hands for the use of tools and elevated his fields of visual and auditory perception. This has important implications for human behavioral adaptations. Black and buff color phases are found in equal numbers in the species Hylobates lar. The head and face of the gibbon resembles that of man in some respects, and the brain is proportionately larger than that of monkeys. The eyes and their orbits are proportionately larger than those of man. Gibbons have proportionately the longest arms of all the catarines, that is, the primates found in Africa and Asia. They have stout trunks and short legs. They do not have tails. Like monkeys, they have ischial callosities. Gibbons are strictly arboreal in their native habitats. It is estimated that they travel by brachiating or swinging about 90% of the time and by walking on large branches of trees the rest of the time. Many of the following scenes are shown in slow motion in order that the details of behavior can be better analyzed. The basic action in brachiating is this pendulum-like swing. The arm motion during the swing is emphasized, showing the advantage which is taken of momentum in this type of locomotion. With the gibbon brachiating on this bamboo pole, slow motion photography shows in considerable detail the patterns of action and allows us to see how these relate to the anatomical structure of this primate. Brachiating is composed of periodic units called swings. The span of the swing varies with the speed. There are marked rotational movements of the shoulder, wrist, and hand. 
the hand hooks on one side or the other of the pole to adjust for lateral imbalance. While swinging without locomotion, the arms form a V. Length of the arms plus chest width in the adult given may equal 60 inches. The hair is long, very dense, and silky. In the forest, rapid alternation may take place from brachiating to walking as the ape adjusts its actions to the particular character of tree trunks and branches. Jumps are made from the seated, standing, or swinging positions and may span 40 feet. The fulcrum has shifted from the hands to the feet which grasp the pole in a straight line action, with one foot being placed directly in front of the other, which action rotates the hips and pelvis. The long arms are used as auxiliary balancing mechanisms. Observe the long arms, stocky trunk, and relatively short legs. Note the apparent smile. This particular specimen has learned to walk in an unusually erect manner, balancing herself without much use of her arms. Specimens not raised in captivity do not walk as well. Learning is necessary to perfect this skill. The foot is not well adapted structurally for support on a flat surface. Slow motion shows the running action at one-third the normal rate. Gibbons cannot run on the ground as fast as a man. This is gibbon locomotion on the ground at its best. There is rhythm, grace, and a high degree of coordination in this action. Gibbons use their hands, feet, and teeth while eating fruits, leaves, buds, and insects. They are principally frugiferous. Those conditioned to each other show relatively mild competition. There are no cheek pouches for temporary storage of food. They are very selective in their feeding habits, showing marked preferences for certain kinds of foods. Males and females seem to be almost equally dominant. Within the family, strong attachment exists between individuals. Observe the typical seated posture with legs drawn up to the chest, the sharp flexure of arms. Food is held in the feet. A mature female, characteristically searching for insects underneath leaves, has natural preferences for foods including spiders, ants, and bugs. Gibbons are also fond of bird's eggs and even young nestlings. They catch insects in the palms of their hands and pick up small objects between the short thumb and the side of the first finger. The feet are used in holding and manipulating foods. Even while swinging by one arm, the gibbon may effectively use its feet, free hand and mouth, to prepare, hold, and eat foods. The feet are structurally adapted for grasping. The narrow nose and catarine facial features are shown here. In this scene, and the one following, glimpses may be had of the long, keen canine teeth, which gibbons may use with telling effect when they are stimulated to anger. Observe that the teeth and lips are used with the hands in selecting and stripping grass seeds. The hand can be studied at close range, showing the hook-like flexure, which makes it more adapted for swinging from a limb than for fine grasping or prehension movements. Gibbons drink by dipping the back of the fingers into water and then sucking off the adhering drops. This habit of drinking is believed to be peculiar to gibbons. Captive animals may eventually learn to drink from pans.
Gibbons keep their coats of hair clean of dirt and ectoparasites by individual and social grooming. This activity requires both gross and fine patterns of prehension. Individuals respond readily to opportunities to groom or to be groomed. Two animals may alternate in the active and passive roles. Is this altruistic behavior? Professor Robert M. Yerkes has suggested that this behavior is homologous to human mutual aid activities. Their fine prehensory movements are used to full advantage in parting the hair, inspecting the coat, and removing particles of scale, other waste, and parasites. The characteristics of action patterns of posture, locomotion, and prehension constitute the background against which all other kinds of behavior must occur. These limit and give form to an animal's behavioral adaptations. Those anthropologists may be correct who assume that the progenitors of man progress from the ground to the trees and back to the ground as quadrupedal locomotion developed into brachiation and this into human bipedal type of walking. Throughout evolutionary development, behavioral and structural changes have been closely interrelated. they're just like people um yeah every once in a while i run, run across one of these films and this one uh, surprisingly had narration a lot of times it's just uh, silent with uh, inner titles uh so behind me i'm out of practice here uh, on the Sintel film scanner i have a film set up that i just got on ebay so brace yourself uh no i don't think this is going to be as challenging as an ant keeper but um yeah let's let's uh Watch what we got. The gift. I need to rewind and stuff. Hold on one sec. Sorry. Plus, I don't think the audio is working. birthday. What is it? A box, dummy. I know that, but what's in it? A secret. I won't tell. I know you won't tell because I'm not going to tell you. And I won't tell you what I'm going to get her. I don't really care because I don't want to know anyway. Well, my present's better than yours. I bet. It is. It's bigger, too. We'll see. Gonna buy mom's present. Forty-five. What are you gonna get her? Seven. I don't know, but a big present. Seventy-one, seventy-two, seventy-three, seventy-four, seventy-five. Would you take me to the store? Sure. Come on.
What'd you get? Nothing, huh? Guess you ain't gonna have a bigger present than me after all. Maybe no present at all. I know just the thing to get from Mom. So? For you to get from Mom. Really? Give me your money and I'll go get it for you. I want to go too. Nope, it's a secret. I can't go? For it to work right, you can't know what it is until Mom opens it. Can't even see it? No. It's a really big present. Real big? Real big. Okay. Now here's the important thing. You have to make a really pretty card for Mom. I'll make the prettiest I can. Okay, that'd be great. I hope Mom likes it. I'm gonna give a gift. You never guess what it is. probably got it out of that box of 500 bows in the closet. <laughs> yeah, Mom, you've got every bow from every present you ever had. They're pretty, too. That's right. Well, you wouldn't want me to throw them away now, would you, oh, no. Mike, I don't know what you have in here, but you sure don't want it to get out. Oh, look at this. I think I know what it is. It's a teapot. Oh, honey, it's just what I needed. Oh, I love it, honey. It's just what I needed. I knew you needed one. Thank you. Oh, I love it. Mm. Thanks. Oh, beautiful. Believe me, you won't mind that half as much in a couple of years. <laughs> yeah, I know. Oh, oh here comes the birthday. Oh, oh, here comes oh the big Carol, one. Mike, what have you done? I've never What's seen that? such a big package in my whole life. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, look at that box. Goodness. Oh, what is it? Oh, goodness, what's in it? Look at this. Oh, this is really amazing. Oh, look at this. That's beautiful. Happy birthday, Mom. I love you a lot from Carol. Now, that's really a beautiful gift, honey. Thank you, darling. What's the present, What's in Mom? It? It's a, a beautiful card that Carol made herself. And look at the beautiful words inside. 
Thank you, honey. I love it. That's it? <laughs> Carol, that's beautiful, That's honey. it? That's all that was in that box? Come on. That was all. Very beautiful. Let's see what's so funny. Oh, pretty sneaky, all right. Pretty good. Well, you started it, wise guy. Why, what do you mean? He said he'd give you the biggest present. But Carol didn't have very much money. So I had this idea about a big box of love. Well, did she understand that there wasn't going to be anything else in the box? I just told her to make a nice card. And I'd take care of the rest. I guess she expected something else. I should have told her. Oh, poor Carol. I better go see what she's doing. Excuse me. Carol, can I talk to you? Oh, Carol, I loved your present. It was just a demo card. No, it wasn't. It was a beautiful card. Look at me. Come on, now listen to me. This present that you gave me doesn't come in five different colors or have 14 different speeds or have a bell that goes off when something's done. It doesn't do a blessed thing. But make me feel good. Why, I can put this present on my dresser and every day for the rest of my life I can look at it and know that a pretty little girl made it for me because she loved me. That's what a gift is. It's a way of telling someone how you feel. Do you believe that? Do you understand? Do you like it better than the teapot? Can you picture your brother sitting down and drawing me a picture with flowers on it and saying, I love you? <laughs> Not him. I mean, the teapot was his way of saying the same thing, that he loves me. But you, you can't put a price tag on love. No matter how hard you try, it's just impossible. Okay? Um, yeah, I was, I was concerned it was going to take a religious turn there. Um, <laughs> given who I bought it from, I bought it from the same person who, <coughs> excuse me, I bought, uh, Ann Keeper from. Um, and so I wasn't sure where it was going to go. But China Phillips, hmm, hmm, interesting. Let's, uh, let's look that up on IMDb. Uh, but anyways, uh, William Crane, I think... I feel like he did, I have to do some research and see what other films he did uh, in my collection that I've shown. But uh, in the meantime, uh, let's watch The Community. Enjoy. In any human community, we have different kinds of jobs or roles. Policemen and housewives, clerks and children, students and grocers. Each has a special job or place. Each person is part of his particular community because he depends on the others in some way. Each has a certain niche in his community. Natural communities, too, are organized according to the niches of the many different living organisms. 
Take the pine forest, for example. Each organism in the community occupies a niche according to the role it plays, forming what the ecologist calls a biotic community. The primary source of energy on Earth is the sun. Green plants convert the sun's energy into the organic matter that all organisms must have to live. In most biotic communities, certain plants provide the main food energy and set the character of the community. Such plants are called the dominant plants. Here, the pine trees are the dominant plants. Determine what kinds of other organisms can live here. The pine trees are called the primary food producers, but other green plants in this community also serve as food producers. All the other organisms, large and small, are consists that depend on the food producers. This is one kind of planter, or herbivore. Herbivores are specially adapted for feeding on plants. Herbivores are eaten in turn by other animals, the primary carnivores. The aphis lion competes with the ladybird beetle for a diet of aphids. Primary carnivores serve as food for secondary carnivores, such as this bird. Carnivores are usually larger and fiercer than their prey, and fewer in number. Some animals occupy more than one niche. Bears, for example, can be either herbivore or carnivore, depending on whether they find berries or fish to eat. Some organisms live by feeding on others without killing them. This is the niche of the parasites. Almost every living thing is subject to some form of parasite. All organic matter, living or dead, eventually serves as food for some organism. Dead organic matter, such as this fallen tree, is being eaten by scavengers. Termites occupy the niche of the scavenger in this rotting log. In the log live other scavengers, ants and millipeds which feed on dead organic matter in the vicinity. The activities of these scavengers break down the log for organisms of another niche, the decomposers. The decomposers may be bacteria, yeasts, or this mold. These organisms convert organic matter into simpler substances, which can be used by green plants in their growth and in the making of food, thus making it available for another food energy cycle. Other communities may have different kinds of organisms, but the basic niches always remain the same. Grass is the dominant food producer here, giving the community its name, the grassland. Then what eats the grass? Cattle have replaced the bison that were once the largest herbivores on the grasslands of North America. Among the smaller herbivores are the insects. It takes a great many herbivores, such as grasshoppers, to feed one primary carnivore, such as a bird. Each niche contains a larger number of individuals than the niche that eats it. This numerical relationship is called a pyramid of numbers. Grass is eaten by the grasshopper. The grasshopper is eaten by the frog. The frog is eaten by the snake. The snake is eaten by the hawk. This is called a food chain. Because the hawk has no larger predators, it is called the top carnivore in its food chain. There are many food chains in a community. Here is another. Grass is eaten by the rabbit. The rabbit is eaten by the fox. Because it eats other animals too, the fox is a link in several food chains. 
The fox is a top carnivore in this food chain. Yet it is attacked by organisms of another niche, the parasites. The complex of all the food chains in a community is called a food web. Since there is dead organic matter, we know there will be scavengers. Flies and beetles occupy that niche here. Bacteria and fungi occupy the niche of decomposers. They convert the organic matter into substances that green plants can use as food, forming the basis for the cycle of matter and energy of the community, with its many niches and its food web. Here on the California coast is a different community, the intertidal community. Let us see how the niches are filled here. Begin by asking the ecologists questions. What is the primary food producer? Is it the mussel? Is it the starfish? Is it the barnacle? Of all the organisms that together form this community, which are the herbivores? Which are the carnivores? Which are the scavengers? The primary food producers here are microscopic single-celled plants called algae. Feeding on algae are myriads of tiny copepods. They occupy an important niche. Can you name it? Copepods serve as food for small fish. The niche? Smaller fish? The sea anemone is another kind of secondary carnivore. The dead fish is eaten by the crab. What niche does the crab occupy? What place does the octopus chain? And what eats the seagull? The dead seagull is eaten by scavengers. Most biotic communities are complex. Yet in any community, the same questions can be asked. What are the primary food producers? What niche does each organism occupy? You can ask these questions wherever you are, whether you are in a desert, whether you are in a tropical rainforest, or whether you are in the community where you live. Put the mic on. Um, that didn't go where I thought. I thought, oh, an EB film about the community. I was like, oh, no, it's about uh, bio communities. Um, fascinating. Although you, you can certainly extrapolate um, what happens in uh, nature with uh, actual communities. And where does next door fit in? Uh, um, anyways, uh, thanks for watching. Uh, I'm not done yet, but I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, and one way you can say thank you is by hitting the thumbs up button, the like button, the subscribe button. Those are ways to game the algorithms to say that uh, this guy who shows old 16 millimeter films is, is mildly interesting and should survive the purge. Um, 
that will eventually come on YouTube uh, and on Facebook. Uh, you can also buy us coffee, and uh, you can go to ko-fi.com slash abgeeks, and I will uh, level with you. We don't always spend it on coffee. Um, otherwise, we would be very jittery, um, and uh, it would be problematic. We do spend it on things like uh, paying for the internet, uh, paying for the services to distribute uh, the things, buying a new webcam, buying a new, uh, buying some new films on eBay. Uh, occasionally, we do that. We go and look for stuff that nobody else is bidding on, like the gift, like uh, Ant Keeper, um, and uh, yeah, um, those are great ways you can support us. Uh, and just telling people about what we do and s spreading the word is another way. Uh, I've got another film up on the Telecine, and it's by our good friends at the Moody Institute of Science. Uh, in this one, they talk about the electromagnetic spectrum. So how can we shoehorn God into that? Let's find out. Enjoy. The light revealing this beautiful butterfly was inside the sun, eight minutes and 19 seconds before the picture was taken. But once the light left the sun, it started traveling at a constant speed of 186,272 miles per second. Without light behaving very consistently the way it does, none of what is happening right now would be taking place. You wouldn't exist, neither would I. In fact, without the sun and the radiant energy it showers upon the earth, the plants on the earth could not exist. Without plants, animals would starve. Man himself would have no food, and that would take care of that. But we do have light, and you're there, and I'm here, and we have a fascinating subject to explore. This is what is called the electromagnetic spectrum, a chart giving us information about different kinds of radiant energy. From here to here, it's all electromagnetic radiation. Visible light is this part of the spectrum, and we're going to have more to say about that. But for right now, let's get acquainted with a few basic things you may not have known. We can see that there are different kinds of radiant energy, and we need to understand something about ways in which one kind will differ from another. Notice the words frequency and wavelength. They both have to do with the way in which radiant energy travels through space. Waves of water, with which we're all familiar, can help to illustrate the point. Water waves and light waves have certain similarities. With a ripple tank, we can create waves of water and even control them to some extent for purposes of study. We can make short waves, or long waves. And as you can see, the longer waves are less frequent. There are fewer of them than the shorter waves. That's why we refer to the lower frequency of long waves and the higher frequency of short waves. And so it is with radiant energy. At one end of the spectrum, the waves are long, very long. At the other end, extremely short. In fact, the frequencies get so high up here that for most of us, numbers lose all meaning. But the point is, as the wavelength decreases, the frequency of the waves increases. So from here on, for all practical purposes, when we talk about frequencies, it has to do with the number of waves of radiant energy that would pass by you or any given point in one second. Now, here are the different kinds of radiant energy. Way down here at the low end of the spectrum, we find electric waves that measure thousands of miles in length. The use of these waves has become very important to our lifestyle. 
the 60 cycle alternating current that comes into our homes, our businesses, the places we go, this kind of energy is found in this area of the spectrum. As we move to higher frequencies, we get into radio waves. With small man-made receivers, we've been putting this energy to use, carrying sound for a number of years. As the wavelengths get shorter yet, we need a different kind of receiver, a receiver we call a short wave radio. Also in the short wave area is the citizens band of frequencies. And UCBers know what happens on these wavelengths. Here you start picking up FM signals. We're all familiar with FM radio and the fact that these are the waves we use to carry sound for television. And here we find the shortest of our radio waves, microwaves. Microwaves allow us to clearly communicate around the world or for that matter to the moon. And we all wonder at the speed with which microwaves cook our food. Radar also puts the microwave to use in air traffic control, in defense technology, and they're an invaluable aid to the weatherman as he locates and tracks storms and hurricanes. Sits in that one spot, it may be a flood problem. Here is an area we call infrared, very important to us. With these waves, our own bodies become the receiver. No radios, no revolving dishes, but a very important relationship we call heat. Infrared is also used in photography. Ever watch a weather forecast? Infrared pictures taken from satellites convey information about weather over large portions of the Earth. Now between infrared and ultraviolet, there is that small but vital part of the electromagnetic spectrum we call visible. We'll come back to this in a moment, but first, let's get acquainted with the rest of the spectrum. Or perhaps I should say, renew our acquaintance, because chances are, at one time or another, you've had a painful experience with these, the ultraviolet rays. These are the rays responsible for that sunburn, even on an overcast day. Then we come to x-rays, radiation that we ourselves cannot feel or see without help. But these rays can tell a doctor a great deal about what's going on inside our bodies. Because fortunately, photographic film is sensitive to x-rays and captures a telltale picture of what the rays encounter as they go through the body. Up here, we get into the area of gamma rays and beyond that cosmic rays, which are not on the chart, and about which there is a great deal yet to learn. We do know that gamma rays are harmful to the human body, and there's a lot of it in solar radiation. But the atmosphere of the Earth protects us, shielding out most of the gamma rays before they can do their deadly work. But now, getting back to that part of the spectrum we can see, going up from heat rays or infrared, we come to the first part of the visible spectrum which appears to us as red we can easily see what happens as the frequencies increase. And by the way, the frequency of light determines its color. From red, we go to orange, then yellow, then green, and then blue. Violet comes next, and then ultraviolet, which we cannot see. In fact, beyond that, there is no more light visible to the human eye. The chart, however, is a little misleading. It's the result of a mathematician's tool called a logarithmic scale. If this chart were drawn to a linear scale, like a ruler or a yardstick, and we stretched what's represented here from the Earth out into space beyond the farthest limits of the solar system to a distance of 300 billion miles, the visible spectrum, this part right here, 
the part of the spectrum we can see, would measure in relationship to the 300 billion miles one inch. Do you realize what this means? In the profusion of radiant energy all around us, in a sense, we're almost blind. Even so, what we do see, if our eyes are normal, is precisely what we should see. Our limitation of sight works to our advantage. The Creator knew exactly what was needed. For us to see more light would make our world a mass of confusion. To see less would leave us with a tragic deficit. What we have is a beautiful balance. As it is, the light in the visible spectrum conveys so much information to the brain, the eye is considered the most important sensory organ. It is the indispensable tool of vision. It's our principal contact with our world. But now I'm going to say something that at first you may find difficult to believe. Right now, you think you're seeing a crowd of people on the screen, but you're not. A beautiful flower? It just isn't so. You say, oh, look at the mountains. But you can't see the mountains. You're not even seeing me. Now, before you think I've left my senses, let me explain. What you see is light reflected from things which your brain identifies. You see light. Technically, you don't see things at all. These wonderful organs, the eyes, send messages to the brain, which in turn tells you what you're looking at. The eyes are stimulated by reflected waves of energy whose frequencies fall within what we call the visible spectrum. When the optic nerves carry the electrical impulses to the brain, the brain identifies the objects. But as important as they are, and as wonderful as they are, and as dependable as they are, the eye and the brain can still be fooled. In fact, they're being fooled right now. Your eyes are telling your brain that you're seeing motion on the screen. My lips are moving, my hands, my head. But actually, what you're seeing is a series of still pictures being projected on the screen at the rate of 24 pictures per second. Due to what is called persistence of vision, your brain interprets what is being seen as motion. And whether you realize it or not, you're not only seeing still pictures, half of the time you're sitting there in the dark. Figure it out. The transport mechanism in the projector, as in the camera, holds each frame of picture in the gate for about one fiftieth of a second, and then takes about the same amount of time to pull the next frame down. While it's pulling the frame down, the blade of a shutter obscures the gate. Your persistence of vision will tell you it isn't so, but it is. You're watching still pictures and you're sitting in the dark half of the time. An ordinary light bulb. What color would you say this light is? I suppose we'd have to call it white light, wouldn't we? So, what is white? And where does it fit in the visible spectrum? Actually, white light is a combination of all the colors. By placing a prism in front of a beam of white light, we can separate the light waves by refraction across the entire visible light spectrum. See all the colors? The higher frequencies are blue light, the lower frequencies are red. Now, notice what happens here we have a circle of white light. The circle of white is created by overlapping circles of other colors, red, blue, and green. When we put them all back together, they all combine to create what we call white. Now, if we see it, that's the way it is, isn't it? Well, not necessarily. What color is this ball? Red? Well, actually, it's everything but red. We call it red because that's the color we see. But red is the one color that this ball is not. This ball is everything but green. Blue is the one color that this ball is not. The chemical makeup and the coloring of each of these balls acts like a mirror for the one color we see. It simply does not absorb that color. 
it reflects it. What about white? Well, what appears to be white is simply all the colors in the white light being reflected. Black is either absence of color or all the colors being absorbed. But what would happen to these colors if I use some other kind of light, something other than white light? Well, we can see about that too. We'll turn off the white light. And for a moment, while it's black, think of what I said about your seeing only what was reflected. No light, no reflection. You don't see anything and no color. But now, another source of light, sodium vapor. Notice the effect it has on the colored objects. Okay, I'm going to mix them all up. Now you be the judge. Which balls are red, blue, green? The balls we looked at a moment ago are still there, right before your eyes. It just so happens that sodium vapor light has no red frequencies, or green or blue for that matter. So the colors we saw a moment ago are not in this light to be reflected. Notice what happens when I introduce a source of white light. White light has the frequencies for red, blue and green in its makeup. So with the white light, those colors are there to be reflected by the colored objects. The study of visible light, optics, radiant energy, any one of them could take a lifetime. We've simply come into contact with a few of the basic fundamentals. And we've been having fun with optical illusions and some of the tricks our eyes and minds play on us. But make no mistake about one thing. Radiant energy may be more than meets the eye, but it's an obedient servant. If you know the physical laws governing the universe, you can predict what radiant energy will do. It never changes. Day after day, you can count on it being there to sustain life. It'll always reflect, giving the world shape and size, texture and color. Harnessed properly, radiant energy always is ready to work for you in a countless number of ways. It's a special blessing. You can depend on it. And this dependability has existed from the beginning of time, from the moment the Creator said, let there be light. Uh, I don't know who that guy is. I've never seen him before. Um, and I don't know his name. He's he's definitely post uh, Irwin Moon. Irwin probably retired at some point. Um, and they had that young guy, that young fella, talking about the creator. Uh, so instead of saying God, they say the creator because they don't want to offend um, the majority religions in the United States. Um, they try to pull back and not make it so New Testament e, make it more Old Testament e, and they say Creator instead of God or Yahweh or whoever. So that's why that's there. Um, so I mentioned um, we'll be back tomorrow. Yes, and I mentioned that we had some home movies of DC trip. Uh, so we'll just watch these and uh, use that to kind of go out. Uh, and we will see you again tomorrow. It's great to see everybody. Um, thanks for tuning in while I wasn't there. Uh, and um, reach out to your friends, your family. They might need a little support. You might need a little bit of support. Um, yeah, it's something that I think is important. Um, especially at times like this. So, love you guys. 
we will see you again tomorrow. Uh, here's uh, Home Movies from Washington, D.C. Enjoy. Mm -hmm.